Welcome back to the La Cancha podcast. 10 days is a long time in football. 10 days ago, everyone and their mother was convinced that Real Madrid were going to win La Liga super easy. They were going to run away with it with 1,000 points, 1,000 goals, and that Barcelona was always going to be in crisis. But you know what? Only one of that is true today. And we're going to start off with the game of the weekend in Spain. Barcelona traveling to a packed Wanda Metropolitano which is close to 90% full after the government allowed full capacity stadiums in Spain. And the game lived up to the billing because it was a brilliant first half by Atletico Madrid. Lamar, Felix, and Suarez, they had a triangle that ripped apart Barcelona every time they went forward. You felt that something special was going to happen. And I really enjoyed this performance by Atleti, especially the performance of Joe Felix, who I feel whenever... when he plays he's the kind of player that can give Atletico Madrid another level and that's what he did in this game he he made Ronald Araujo had a have a torrid time in this game because Araujo every every matchup with Jock Felix he always lost it he had her come into the foul or he wasn't close enough in the plays that led to a goal and how brilliant was Thomas Lamar Lamar is the kind of player who's I've, I've said it in this podcast for Atletico Madrid is similar to what Modric brings to Real Madrid or what Iniesta brings to brought or brought to Barcelona. And you saw that in this game. You saw when he came on, he made an impact. He scored a goal. He gave an assist. Every time Atletico were moving forward, they were faster. And they were faster in the way they played. And that's what led to them hurting Barcelona the way they did. Because I really do feel Atletico Madrid should and could have scored more goals in this game. Um, but they decided to be more cautious and Ter Stegen did make a couple, he made a good save for Joao Felix in the second half. And with Atletico Madrid, it's more of what like I was begging for for them last week because now they showed more creativity. They showed they moved the ball quicker. They moved the ball in a speedy way to, to, to hurt Barcelona. Also, you're seeing more attacks from the left side of the field. And I feel in the past, they focused exclusively on the relationship between Trippier and Llorente. And that's what won them the league last season. But now teams have, have begun to figure that out. They need to think of a new partnership to maybe create more, to provide more goals. And that partnership between Lamar, Felix, Suarez, it, it looks like it's working. It looks like it's something that they can build on in the future. And that's something that they can build on maybe to win this league title. For Barcelona, this might sound weird in that I thought this was their best performance. I thought it was their best performance of the season because we've seen Barcelona provide a couple of stinkers in the Champions League, one to Benfica, another to Bayern Munich. And, but in the league, we've seen them win some games. We've seen them like win some games handsomely. But those handsome wins, I, I would always put a caveat in that the other team did not show up. But in this game... I know in the second half, maybe Atletico Madrid allowed them to have more control because they knew that, okay, the attacking lineup for Barcelona, they're, they're impotent enough that they're not going to cause us any issues. But in the first half, especially when it was Zerzer, I felt the midfield went to still with Atletico Madrid. And that's something that I didn't really expect from Barcelona, especially given what happened in Lisbon. But compared to Lisbon, where it was a, I felt it was a disaster in that they didn't play a very good game, they didn't looked like they were up for it. They didn't look like they were competitive enough. In this game, they, they looked very competitive. But the same issues happened, same issues that happened in Lisbon, because in Lisbon, offensively, I felt if Luke de Jong had scored a couple of the goals that he, the chances that he had, he, it could have been a different complexion. And in this game as well, like Felipe Coutinho had three really good chances to maybe make Atletico Madrid more uncomfortable and maybe if he had scored one of those three, it could have been a draw or it could have been a more an an every game for Atletico, but it was so comfortable for Atletico Madrid. They were they were really brilliant. And now like speaking about Barcelona and let's speak about Coleman's future. Because after the game it seems like there's sort of a truce between Coleman and, La, and Laporta. But from what Coleman is saying, I think he has like three games really to save his job. The home game against Valencia, the home game against Dinamo Kiev 
and the home game against Real Madrid, which it's not going to be easy for Coleman to do that because in the classical, I think Real Madrid are the better team, although they're not really proving it at the moment. And they had a similar poor week to Barcelona. They lost against Sheriff, and then they went on to lose in Barcelona against Espanyol. And I'll start with the Sheriff game because in the Sheriff game, I don't think Real Madrid... I think it was a freak game in that Real Madrid created a lot of chances. They had lots of shots and Sheriff had four shots and two of them were, were, were going. Not many clubs had that sort of efficiency. And the second goal by Sheriff, it was a world-class goal. There was nothing they could do about it. But it goes on the trend that Real Madrid, in recent weeks, they've been, or since the start of the season, they've been relying on being good offensively, on scoring goals, on... I'm doing all that to mask the fact that defensively, like they're not as good. And the worrying thing for them, and this is something I discussed last week, is they're beginning to get dominated in the midfield in the big games, but in the small games against Espanol, and with all due respect to Espanol, they're really, I think they're a decent team. They have really good players. They're recently promoted. They haven't set the world at light in the Primera. They, um, they had a couple of draws to Betis, to Sevilla, and they lost to Atletico Madrid. And in those games, I criticized Espanol of like not showing enough creativity, not showing enough dominance, not showing enough ambition. And they showed all of that in this game. They were dominant against Real Madrid in the midfield, especially in the period of time between the first and second goal. I fi- or after the second goal, they could have scored a third or a fourth. They, cre- they created lots of chances. They hurt Real Madrid without being super exposed themselves. They defended well. They they were able to create chances and they were able to light up the game. I, and Barba, Darda, and Raude Tomas had a brilliant game. Raude Tomas, who I've called overrated in the past, I think in this game, he really showed why he is that rated because he was involved in like holding up play and combining with players and scoring the first goal he made a difference in this game like his opposite number Benzema who seems to be Real Madrid's only or the most potent offensive threat at the moment because he scored a really brilliant goal but he can't do it alone and he needs players like Hazard he needs the Vinicius we saw in the past to also show up but like he right now it seems like pretty isolated and it doesn't help when midfield is not a strong like and maybe it's not as strong because Tony Kroos just came back and he's not fully fit. Casemiro was rested and Kamavinga played in this position, but I don't think Kamavinga feels fully comfortable playing as the deep line defensive midfielder. And also, it wasn't the best game from Kroos, from Modric either. Like, he was partly a fault for the second goal. And defensively, they seem all over the place at the moment. They, it's not. Carlo Ancelotti's fault, although his system doesn't help Real Madrid defensively, because before Zidane came in, they had similar issues defensively, and what Zidane decided was that to make this team successful in the way that they win the league and they're very competitive in Europe, I'm going to focus defense first. But it seems Ancelotti has focused offense first, and defensively, there we're beginning to see a lot of the cracks in that they allow lots of shots, they concede lots of goals, like they concede a goal almost every game. But also you can feel sorry for Ancelotti because the defensive lineup that played against Villarreal or have played throughout the season, especially in this game against Espanyol, is not the defensive lineup we'll see. It's not their best defensive lineup because if they played today with the best defensive lineup, it will be Cavajal at right back, Militao and Alaba in the center back, and Mendy in, in the left back. And Mendy makes such a difference because he's so solid defensively whenever he plays they barely lose they barely concede shots and a lot of the goals from Real Madrid prior to Mendy coming into the club and since he's been injured have come predominantly from that left side so it shows that his shadow is like looming large as, as well as shadow of like Ramos and Varane but he, when he comes into the team and when the team is fully fit I do expect to see a better Real Madrid but also the problems in midfield that needs to be sorted out because it's all well and good to be dominated in the midfield against the better teams in La Liga and against um, good teams in the Champions League. But 
against Espanyol, I think Real Madrid can do can do much better than that. And it was, it was shocking for them, shocking performance from them. And uh, moving on, their their level of points were Real Sociedad, who visited Hatafe and Hatafe in, in this game, I felt they were decent in the first half. They they created lots of chances and it led to the goal. But in the second half, they also conceded, and they should have had a penalty. But the fallout from this game is Michel has been sacked as the second manager of casualty in La Liga. We'll talk about the first one later on in this podcast. And I feel the second is justified because we could see it coming. Although I have said that they've had a tough schedule. But I do think this is a team that's one of, like, it's a upper mid-table team. And you expect more from the team based on the players that they've had. And we haven't really seen that from it, from his Hitafe. His Hitafe side, they're too easy to beat. They're not as aggressive as they were on the border last, and they're not creating as much as they were on the border last. And he hasn't gotten the team to click at all. And it's a good, it's a good decision. But I'm fearful of the replacement because the replacement might be Kiki Sanchez Flores. And since since he managed Espanol in 2017, 2018, he hasn't done enough for me to deserve a job of this caliber. Because he was poor at Watford, he was like one of the reasons. Like he he was responsible for the poor start that ultimately sort of led to the relegation. And he he was poor when he was last year with Espanol, and that's why he got sacked. So I don't see why he's getting jobs, but all good luck for them. Because I would I would really hate it if Hetafe got relegated. People might not like them because of their style, but I felt their style on the border last gave them a bit of color that we don't really see them at the moment. And Robert Moreno must be thanking his lucky stars that he got Granada the first win of the season, especially against Sevilla, the big Andalusian rivals, because he could have been in the chopping block as well. A Rochina goal was the only goal that settled it. Granada, from there, like, they defended well, but they defended... They didn't... They weren't, like, holding on, in a sense, in that they were, like, defending quite higher up. And they had lots of chances for the counter-attack to score the second goal. And you felt that if there was going to be a goal, it was going to be Granada's goal. Sevilla, they were, as against Wolfsburg, they were very disappointing in this game. They weren't creative enough. They had they were able to like force a couple of like good, um, good chances for them or like nervy moments for Granada. But they never really created anything that was clear-cut. And this issue goes back to Eva Benega. Because since Eva Benega left Sevilla, I don't think they've fully replaced him. They've not fully replaced a creative midfielder in, that could dominate the game, first of all, with what Lopetegui wants to do. And that can give a pass that's like split, blind split in pass that creates a lot of those clear cut chances. And so they've had to rely on the wingers to add that creativity. And maybe Papu Gomez might be the player that could be Banega, that could be in that midfield, dominating the midfield, giving those passes that allows people into the game, that creates those chances for them to score. But he's been played out on the wings. And also, he keeps on, Lopsegi keeps on playing Suso and Ocampos. And they're not the same players that they were in the first season. Although Suso was good last season, Ocampos is his first season. He hasn't been great. Like his first season was dynamite. It was exciting to watch. He scored goals. He 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 like influenced the play a lot more. Like he for example in the game against Wolves, he scored the goal that lets them get into the semifinals of the Europa League in that in that year. But since then it's been he's been a shadow of himself and I wonder whether Lopetegui is better off just sticking to Lamela. And even going back to Idrisi, Osama Idrisi, who started the season quite well, but we've never really seen much of him since then. Because at the moment, his options aren't working for him. And he said that they deserve to win the game, that he came out to win the game. But on the pitch, he never really felt like they felt that he could win. And they fell into a lot of traps that set out by Granada to waste time. Diego Carlos, like, foolishly got sent off. Like, there was no point of a lot of what happened. And you could tell that the pressure is against Sevilla because this is a huge opportunity for them to win La Liga and compete for it because Real Madrid, they have the issues I've discussed. Barcelona, I think, 
are on Sevilla's level or maybe Sevilla is better. Atletico Madrid are strong, but Atletico Madrid will always give you chances if there's someone there to pressure them. And you can see that pressure getting into them so early on in the season with what's going on with Oscar and Acuna. There was a lot of like arguments between them, wanting one to like keep quiet and criticism, and that's not something that's good to see. So Lopetegui has a lot to work on if he's to get Sevilla back in track because a team like Villarreal, they're getting, they're doing really well and they're like getting to the level where they could challenge Sevilla for that fourth spot. And Villarreal in the game against Betis, they were brilliant. I think this is the best Villarreal in terms of the squad that I've seen since Manuel Pellegrini took them to the Champions League semifinals. It, it's that good because right now with Dan Juma, he scored five goals so far this season. And you think they're still Jared Moreno to come back from injury. There's Sam Chukwese to come back. And I'm really starting to enjoy Villarreal again. They're a team that always play good attacking football. But in recent times, you haven't really seen Villarreal that's that good. But now you're seeing them play very good football Parejo is there to like slow down the game to dominate the midfield and offensively up front they have really fast players who can make a difference and that's something you could accuse Villarreal of in the past that they were a bit too pedestrian going forward but not so much in this game also like as discussed last week in the game against Real Madrid they dominated the midfield they created the more chances the chances that were more likely to lead to goals Against United, they were also dominant in that game. So we're seeing the best version of Villarreal at the moment. But it's a matter of whether they can start converting the, all those draws to wins. Because if they do, and call me crazy, maybe maybe they would have a chance to win La Liga. Maybe they would have a chance to compete and maybe not win it, but like competing or being close enough to like get into the top four and really get that position from Sevilla or Barcelona. Betis, on the other hand, I don't think they showed up in this game. And you could maybe you could forgive them for having a poor game because they've been really good. They, they've they been really good so far. Even Lequeep called them one of the best teams to watch in Europe. And they're the only team and the only Spanish team to have like six out of six. So let's let's forgive them for having this bad game. It, it could be worse. They, they could be Levante who haven't won in 16 games. <laughs> And they were very poor against Mallorca, which led to the first managerial casualty of La Liga, Paco Lopez. We already spoke about the second one with Michel. And I feel the second might be a bit harsh. I know Levante fans don't really like what's happened so far this season because their team haven't played well. The team, they're too loose. It doesn't look like they're having a great season. And the thing is, like as Villarreal found out, if you're one of those teams that are like mid-table, and you have a poor start to the season, you could find yourself in a relegation battle. And maybe that's why Levante and Hetafe have made the decisions they've made so far. Because they both have brilliant squads that might be hard to keep on keep a hold to if they do get relegated. But I, I will miss Paco. Like, I love the way his team plays. I love what he's done on Levante. He's made them a team that's respected. He's made them a team that people want to watch. And he took them to their highest of highs, going to the semifinals of the Copa del Rey. They should have. They were so close to getting to the final and, and playing Barcelona, which would have been a, such a big occasion for them. But I just hope they don't go all the way to the other side and they get a manager that's going to be super defensive. That's going to be like a, as we like to call it in Spanish football circles, a terrorist manager. So I, I hope they get they get a manager who plays like good exciting football as well and and can get them over the hump i do feel paco is going to be back at levante someday maybe after this if the next manager doesn't work and they're looking for a quick fix someone to give the job to they'll give it to him because i do think is he's a bright manager he's a manager that i enjoy i enjoy watching and i enjoy watching his teams but at the moment it's not such a good moment for him but it's a good moment for Elche. They, they've been brilliant. They had a brilliant display against Salta Vigo. It could have been two or three for the host. Salta, they had a go this loud, but I think it was rightly this loud. The bad news for them is they're going to miss Bryas Mendes, who got injured, which is disappointing because he got a call up from, by Luis Enrique, and he was really looking forward to going. But unfortunately, he wouldn't be able to get it through injury. And speaking about unfortunate events, 
let's go to Cardiff versus Valencia, which was, for me, one of the saddest games I've seen in a long time. Not sad because of the style of play or not tr or because of what happened like on the pitch, but what happened off the pitch that made it quite sad for me. Um, because we saw Mukta Diakavi and we saw him get a treatment that I feel was very unfair. And for those who don't know about the Diakabi uh, Kavith affair, we would have to go back to the last season when Kavith and Valencia played, and they played in Kavith's stadium. And Diakabi made an allegation that he was virtually abused by Juan Cala. Valencia players walked off the pitch. The referee allowed that to happen, but later on they came back, and Diakabi had to be substituted. Cala had to be substituted later on. Um, La Liga made an investigation, but I think the investigation was quite weak because we saw nothing come out of that. And the Akabi never made any gesture of disrespect to Kavith, the institution, or to Kavith fans. So when the Akabi came on and he was like booed like the first time, I was like, wow, this is a harsh reception that I don't think he deserves. But they kept on doing it. They kept on doing it with every single touch he had. They booed him as if he was like a Sevilla player who shushed the fans, who said rude things about them. And I felt that was uncalled for. That was borderline racist. And that's not something that should be tolerated in football. It's very difficult to punish, but it was something that I feel stains the institution of Kenneth. Because they're a team that everyone had a soft spot for. But what's the response to the initial situation and the response of the fans to Diakabi this weekend? was disgraceful and was shameful. And it's something that should be a stain on Cadiz. Like, personally, like, I think their style of play is, like, poor anyways, so I wouldn't want them to stay up. But, like, attitudes like this makes it even, makes my position even stronger and, me, and my dislike towards them even stronger. Because you sh can't allow that to happen in professional football. I'm not saying he should have been clapped off the field or anything, but... Why boo him with every single touch? I don't get that. And that was something that was like very triggering and very uh, um, sad to watch. But let's move on to something a bit brighter. We're going to go to Iñaki Williams, who broke a record today, or broke a record this week. And that record was 203 games, the most consecutive appearances for a La Liga player. And it's just like Ali Moreno was talking about it in this in commentary and it's crazy because, like, you think about it, to play 203 games as a forward and not get injured and not get carded, not get suspended, not get sick, not move clubs, not suffer from coronavirus, it's outstanding that he's done that. It's a remarkable achievement. It's a shame that I couldn't round that up with a goal. Raul Garcia got the only goal in this one. And um, I feel for Alaves, I don't know how they beat that Let's Go Madrid, but somehow they did which is weird, but they, they, they don't have enough offensive spark for me to stay up this season. Defensively, they're okay, but like offensively, they don't really create much. Same for Athletic, and I think it's a Basque issue, <laughs> generally, because even you can say the same for Osasuna, they're, where they're very intense, but in some ways, they, they, they create more than these two teams, than Alaves and, and Athletic, but they don't create as much as they should, given that intense style of play but one thing they do do is they make other teams have a bad game <laughs> and that's what happened to Raya Vaikano one of my favorite teams but they got they got murdered this week by Asuna late goal it keeps Asuna fifth in the table and Raya Vaikano is sixth in the table who would have assumed that but it's still a game so a lot to change but I'm pleased for Asuna like is this going to be the Asuna like in the mid 2000s that can qualify for Europe and can threaten to get into the Champions League maybe not but it's an Osuna side that will possibly stay up comfortably this season. And let's go to Europe. And we're going to start off in England that had the game of the week, the possibly the most high-profile game in European football. So far, with two of like the better teams, and that was between Liverpool and City that ended up in a draw. Mo Salah having a brilliant goal. You should all check that out. And it's a 2-2 draw that leaves them both chasing the first, which is Chelsea, who won. United dropped points this week. And with United, they have a good, really good squad. But you just wonder whether they have the right manager. 
I don't think they do have the right manager because I feel if you had Conte coaching this team, this team will be challenging to win the, the league in England and will be out of sight in their Champions League group. But they've lost to the young boys. They were dominated by Villarreal. It remains to be seen whether they can get four points, maximum points against Atalanta. They, they could be in a bind. They, it could take them up until match day six to qualify from this group. Because of their name, Like they're going to be favorites, but I wouldn't be surprised if Atalanta and Villarreal qualify at their expense, given how the fact that they're not really convincing at the moment, especially in the Champions League. And let's move on to Atalanta's country, Italy. And let's speak about a manager who gets the best with the raw materials is given and that's Max Allegri they won the Turin Derby against Torino thanks to Locatelli and they won in midweek against Chelsea which are one of which is one of the best teams in Europe at the moment and Chiesa got a goal for in the Chelsea game and they defended well like people might complain that okay they only had like 23% possession but Italian teams have done that for ages and Allegri is a classic Italian manager and he gets results, and that's one of that's one of the reasons why I do feel for him that Juve will be will be okay. They're four points of Roma, they're six points of Inter Milan, and it's within their hands to finish above both of them. And I think I think they might finish above Roma, and they might finish in the in the UCL spot. Although Roma got back to winning ways this weekend. Inter, on the other hand, they came back from behind to beat Sassuolo, but. It's their Champions League form that, for me, worries me. Because Inter, they're one of the teams that they should be competing on the high level. With the squad they have, they should be getting out of the Champions League group regularly. But it's three before this, it was three seasons where they couldn't get out of the group. And they found increasingly, increasingly creative ways of not to qualify. Because in all the games... In all their games and in, in the previous groups, by the last by the time they got to the last game of the season, it was within their hands to qualify. And a lot of times it was against like weaker teams or weaker position that they should be beaten. Once was against a Barcelona side that rested most of their players. Another season was against PSV, another season was against Shakhtar Donetsk. And it wouldn't surprise me if Inter go into those two games against Sheriff and they don't get maximum points and they find themselves like struggling to get out of this group but i hope for their sake that they can because like it'll be nice to have an inter milan that's in the latter rounds of the champions league competing with the big boys and hopefully we see that ac milan they had a disappointing champions league as well they lost to atletico madrid in a controversial game cassier got sent off but before then i felt milan they looked really strong they bossed atletico madrid but Cassier got himself sent off foolishly. Um, there was a bit of controversy for the final penalty. I think I can understand why the referee gave the penalty. And also, I don't think it's a big conspiracy against Milan because Atletico Madrid had a couple of calls that should have been penalties, in my opinion. But um, that's for another day. They In the Lombardi Derby against Atalanta, they were brilliant. They came out of blocks. They scored three goals. Atalanta came back late on. But... It's good for Milan. They're the they're the point of the season where they're very close to the top, and we're seeing AC Milan get somewhat back. They're not back to the old Milan that would dominate to Europe, but they're back to being a team in Europe that people are beginning to take seriously. And I think if they have more performances like the ones against Atletico, teams would begin to see them as a serious team in in Europe. And it's how they play against Porto might might be the deciding factor in their destiny in this group but they possibly can still qualify although they have zero points at the moment and Porto are a tough nut to crack I know Liverpool made them look like men's meat but they could be difficult but Milan they're they're on the right track they're on the right track and another team that's on the right track definitely is Napoli who they won again they came back from behind against Fiorentina to win this 2-1 Maybe it's time to start thinking of Napoli as title challengers because they have they have maximum points so far. They are the only team in Europe with a hundred percent record, and it's time to start thinking about them. I'm sorry, only team in the top five leagues in, with a hundred percent record. So it's time to start thinking about them as title challengers. Although they did get 
they did get their comeuppance against Spartak Moscow in a shock results, but it is what it is. And speaking of shock results, Paris Saint-Germain had a shock result against Ran, and that's how they lost their 100% record. They played with the full Galactic 11, Mbappe, Di Maria, Neymar, Messi all starting, but none of them could get a shot on target against Ran. And every time PSG have gone to Ran in the last three seasons, they haven't gotten a win once. In fact, they've dropped seven points in that stadium in the past three seasons, which is crazy. But this comes off of the back of a magnificent performance against City where they were able to get the win midweek. Messi scored a brilliant goal. And so maybe this was just like, it was diff it's sometimes difficult to come from those highs as a club to get to the meats and potatoes of playing the league position. I remember when Barcelona had that comeback against um, against Paris Saint-Germain. They got back to La Liga and they got beaten by Deportivo. So sometimes it does happen, especially against a team that where you have a poor record against. So, And they didn't miss a lot of chances. Like Mbappe had like several chances to kill, to, to score and to make this game more competitive. But all credits to Ron, who were managed by Bruno Canessio, who has a habit of winning high-profile games like this, especially when it was at Lyon. He, he famously beat Manchester City, beat PSG, and he used to win all the big games against all the big clubs. Lyon, at the moment, they tied the Ron Derby against an Etienne. It, again, like it's with Peter Bosch. I'm not sure what his plans are for Lyon. He hasn't really set the world alight, and I still wish Rudy Garcia was still there because like Saint Etienne are at the bottom of the table, and I think Lyon should be beating them. But those are things that happens when it happens. But that, that's football, and Lyon are they're getting back to feeling confident again in in Liga. Although in the Champions League they lost to Salzburg. Karim Adeyemi scoring both goals, scoring a brace, and it's funny with Salzburg because. All their goals have been penalties. They've gotten five penalties in the last two games. I think them and Sevilla, they've gotten penalties in both the games. And they've only scored penalties, which is weird. But going back to Lille, they, they beat Marseille this week. Jonathan David with a brace. The Canadian boy showing like showing his quality and helping Lille and being the leader for Lille so far. And I'm not sure whether he might stay at that club beyond the season. Because it seems like it might be the season where they can cash in on on him, maybe selling to a big English club or a big Spanish or Italian club. We'll see what happens. But the team that's keeping pressure on PSG with Marseille falling off the rails a bit is Lance, surprisingly. And they, they keep on winning. They're six points behind PSG. They're making a Tatsuris out of it. And let's see whether how far they can keep going. But right now, it's it's interesting to see how they play. They keep names them as one of the most exciting teams to watch so let's see let's see how, how far they can they can do and they can do and moving to the bundesliga in the theme of big clubs not winning Bayern munich also didn't win surprisingly in the league where they're supposed to be the only they're supposed to like win every game 5-0 and like do all these things comfortably, but that's mostly spoken by people who never watched the Bundesliga or never followed the Bundesliga, because Bayern do get their comeuppance sometimes, and they did this weekend to Eintracht Frankfurt, and they, they lost 2-1. Leverkusen, they're level on points with Bayern. They they won this weekend by four goals to zero, but Wolfsburg, the wheels keep on coming up, up for them. They In midweek, they maybe could have gotten the win against Sevilla. They lost last week. They 3-1 to Hoffenheim. They lost this week 3-1 at home to Gladbach. Some brilliant goals by Brad Embolo, who his first goal was amazing. Like the volley was was world class. And they're slipping away. And guess what? Like Freiburg, surprisingly, they're they've taken their spot in the top four. It would be brilliant if Freiburg can qualify for the Champions League, but I think it's gonna be tough for them because Leipzig they're getting back in their groove thanks to Nkunku, although they did lose against Club Brugge midweek, which is a disappointing result for them because it might mean that even getting to the Europa League might be a diff might be a tall order for Leipzig at this point in this group. But you never know because like things can change very quickly. It's changing for them in the Bundesliga. They're five points off the top four. 
which at this point of the season, it's very easy to make up. So I wouldn't worry too much about them. Maybe they might not challenge Bayern. That that's Dortmund's job. Dortmund continue they continue to win. They continue putting that pressure. They won without Holland, and it's just one point separating the top four in the Bundesliga. It's we're we're seeing exciting races in a lot of these leagues, and I'm excited to see what happens there in the Bundesliga this season because you're seeing a lot of good stories. In Portugal, it was a bad week for Sporting and Porto in the Champions League. Sporting they lost narrowly to Dortmund, while Porto they got their ass whooped by Liverpool. They must be sick of the side of Liverpool come to the drag out because every time Liverpool come there, Liverpool usually destroys them. But but they they will be happy that Benfica drop points. They lost this weekend. Benfica again another team coming off a uh, high of like beating a top European team getting to the meat and potatoes of league football and losing so it's a one point difference between themselves and Sporting and Porto so another league with a very exciting title to race and with Benfica I'm like all credits to them against Barcelona I felt they were really good they created lots of chances they set out the pressure right from the off and they made Barcelona look like it's a team from their league a team a mid-table Portuguese team and how they dominated them and watch out for Darwin Nunez. I used to watch him when I was playing in La Liga Smart Bank, which is second division of La Liga. And I think he's going to be a player, a striker who's going to, who has a great future out of him. So watch out for that. But at the moment in Portugal, it looks like it's going to be a brilliant title race. It looks like this season so far, we're set up for brilliant title races across the board in Europe. Maybe not France, but let's see what happens in the future. And that's it for this week. Um, I'm going to have a couple of special episodes. I'm playing a couple of special episodes to discuss the Super League and one to discuss El Clasico when it's close by. So watch out for that. You can follow me at Tajadine Triple Zero at twi- on Twitter or on Instagram. And also leave a like and subscribe. And if you're if you really enjoyed what you listened to, share it. It makes my ego a bit bigger not to have a big ego but it makes me feel good about doing this week in week out although i know it's like only although i know it's i do this for the fun of it so but it's always nice to like get the word out and i hope you have a beautiful week enjoying the beautiful game